Hello my friends, my name is Lucas Mann, I'm the pastor of the Spring Church and I come out here with some dear brothers and sisters in the Lord to preach the gospel of salvation to you first and foremost but also to, to, to offer help to you dear friends, to offer help to you concerning your child. We come out here to, to offer that, that we will walk you through the, the pregnancy, we just ask that you choose life. We come here to warn you, my friends, because of the, the horrible results of abortion. I'm not referencing a, a temporal result, but I'm talking about your souls, my friends. To slaughter your child is a, is a great evil against the Lord. And so we want you to be reconciled with your Creator. Friends, you're here as a display of your being an enemy of God. Your being here testifies to your hatred of Him. And my friends, the only way you'll be saved is by the work of God's Holy Spirit. It's by God saving you from your sins. In fact, my friends and I have been praying this morning for your salvation and for your child to be saved from this horrible fate. Do not do this, dear friends. We, we're willing to help you. There's, there's a place just down the road, just right in Greenville. People are waiting to adopt your child. People are, are on waiting lists willing to walk you through the entire process. I personally commit myself to walk through the entire pregnancy with you. My church will help you. But friends, even above that, we offer to you something which is the greatest offer you can possibly receive, and that is the offer of free salvation in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of sins, imputed righteousness, eternal life, dear friends, this is what you need. This is what you need, friends, because if you don't have this, you will perish in your sins. And so the text I'd like to direct your attention to this morning is in the book of, of, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The Apostle Paul says these words. He says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. And dear friends, if I could title this anything, it would be the word of the cross. Friends, you must come to understand the word of the cross. You must come to grasp the preciousness of the word of the cross. You must come to believe the word of the cross. In fact, many of you, as I preach this, doubtless will react by thinking it is foolishness. Foolishness that we're out here. Foolishness we're preaching Christ. Foolishness that we're calling you to repent. But friends, it is because you are perishing. You are present tense. Perishing. And so that is why we come out here, friends. We care for your souls. We care for your eternal state. We care for the life of that child. That that child not be lost. That child not be killed. We come here to prevent evil. To prevent evil which will damn souls, which will destroy lives. Not only is the eternal effect upon your soul great, but even the temporal effects of slaughtering your child is great. In fact, I can guarantee you, you will come to regret this. You will come to regret this not only in the life to come, but even in this life. Statistically speaking, you will. And here in 1 Corinthians 1, the Apostle Paul is addressing the issue of wisdom versus foolishness. See, in Paul's culture, in, in ancient Greece, it was, the, it was one of the chiefest things you could pursue was wisdom. But it was not a godly wisdom, it was a worldly wisdom. It was a wisdom according to the world. And the true wisdom is an understanding of the cross of Christ. In fact, I, I would submit to you that there are many of you here who claim to be Christians, who claim to be followers of Christ. Perhaps you walk the aisle, you said the prayer. Perhaps you go to church even on Sunday. You're a Christian just on Sunday. And you're hypocrites. And so we call you even to repent. Because you're surely unconverted. You're surely lost. Not a, a genuine Christian wouldn't be here. A genuine Christian wouldn't do this. And so we even address you both the, the pagan and the, the hidden pagan. The pagan who's a pagan and they don't know it. 
And we bring the wisdom of God, which is the word of the cross. And that's why in verse 18 he says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Why is the word of the cross, dear friends? Why is the word of the cross foolishness? You need to be saved from your sins, sir. Why is the word of the cross foolishness, dear friends? Because people do not understand the character of God and the righteousness of God. They do not understand that Scripture clearly presents God to be a holy God, a righteous creator. He is a consuming fire, Deuteronomy 4.24 says. In fact, in Leviticus 9 and 10, we see God institute uh, for the, uh, the ironic priestlyhood that they were to... Um, they were to offer up sacrifices to the Lord, and if they did it improperly, then God would consume them with fire. In fact, they, He did that very thing in, in Leviticus 10. When they offered up strange fire before, before the Lord, God is perfect. God is holy. Dear friends, it is true that God is, is gracious, and He is compassionate. He is abounding in loving kindness. That is so true, and I never want to take away from that, but friends, you must understand this which is alien to your fleshly understanding of God, and that is that He is holy. In fact, the, uh, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, is, is granted the grace to have a vision of God. He says in uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verse 1, he says, in the, king of, uh, excuse me, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And the one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then listen to verse 4. And the, the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Verse 5. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live a, among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Dear friends, God is holy. Uh, one of the most holy men in his day, the prophet Isaiah, stands in the Lord's presence, and he says, Woe is me. And you think on the day of judgment that you will be all, all right with God, that He will just sweep your sin under the rug. How foolish, my friends. How foolish to think that God will simply arbitrarily forgive your murderous deeds. How, how foolish it is to think God will forgive you of your fornication, of your pornography addiction, of your slaughtering of your child. Dear friends, think about what a great evil that is before the eyes of the Lord. What is done under this red roof is not hidden from His sight. He is aware of everything that is going on in that place of death, that den of demons, that house of murder. He is aware of, of what those doctors do. He is aware of what those nurses aid in doing. He is aware of all the wickedness of your heart. He is, he is omnipresent. He is everywhere, friends. He sees your mind and He sees your heart and He knows that you are wicked. Friends, we cry out to you. We call you friends because we care for your souls. I, I plead with you. Do not slaughter your child. This guilt before the Lord is too great for you to bear. The stain upon your soul will be punished in eternal hellfire. See, God is, is described as the just judge of the universe. In a Psalm 119, 137, the psalmist says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. God does not deal unrighteously, but righteously. He de de uh, deals in holiness, and therefore no one can stand before His presence. In fact, I don't even say this from a position of pride. I know that I myself am a sinner outside of Christ and am condemned to hell just like all of you. But friends, I have something which you do not have, and I want to offer it to you today as the outward call of the gospel goes forth. Friends, we want you to be attentive to the Word of the Lord. Hear the Gospel message. This is the Word of the Cross, but we first must understand the character of God, the, the greatness of sin, and the punishment thereof. We must understand the bad before we can see the good. Oh dear friends, what doctor would go and tell his patients about all the treatment options for their various diseases 
without first telling them about the diseases which they have. Friends, a good doctor takes the time and explains the illness that the patient is afflicted with. Friends, we must explain that not only are you ill, but you have been killed by sin. And as the Apostle Paul says in, in Ephesians 2.1, you are dead in your sins. As he says in Romans 1.30, you are haters of God and you are enemies of Christ. And friends, you, there is no neutrality with Christ. Don't think you're in a neutral position. Don't think just because, well, you say you're an agnostic or an atheist, that there, even if there is a God, that you're just kind of a neutral position with Him. Friends, you're either the enemies of God or you're the friends of Him. And not only has God declared that He is holy in His Word, but He has put His holiness on display. He has shown us in His law His holiness. The law reflects two things, friends, and I want to explain this to you very thoroughly that you might understand the word of the cross, that you might grasp what Jesus did. The law reflects two things. Firstly, it reflects the character of God, and then secondly, it reflects the character of man in light of the character of God. And we're going to start by looking at the first one, that is that it reflects the character of God. See, friends, God has said in His law things like you shall not lie, you, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery. Why does God command those things? Why does God say you shall not murder? It is because He is not a liar, He is not a thief, He is a faithful covenant-keeping God, and He is not a murderer. And so, friends, when you do these sins, when you commit these sins, especially the sin of, of murder, of taking the life of the innocent, you are acting in contradiction to the character of your Creator, and you are rebelling against His natural order. In fact, I want to say this. that this, The Bible says that, that humankind has been made in the image of God. We have been made in the image and likeness of our Creator. And when you take the life of the innocent, dear friends, when you go into a place like this and you slaughter your child and you murder your baby, you are desecrating the image of God. What a great evil that is to, to take God's image and destroy it. So friends, as I mentioned a moment ago, these other sins, lying, thievery, Adultery, I could go on and describe idolatry. Many of you are idolaters. In fact, I know this. God has created you to worship. You have the seed of religion within you. You, are, you. you must worship something. But because you are bound to sin, because your will is bound to iniquity, you can only worship sin, you can only worship yourself, you can only worship a false god, and you cannot worship the God of Scripture. Even you who claim to be non-religious claim to be secular friends you worship things I might not know particularly what you worship but I do know that you worship and it is certainly not the true God of Israel friends you might worship your money you might worship your success you might worship a car you might worship material possessions you might worship your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your spouse you might worship a pleasure you might worship your television I don't know what you worship friends but you know you know your guilt before God. See, my friends, you are not without excuse. Or excuse me, you are not with excuse, I should say. That is that you have an excuse before God. You are without it. You know that there is a God. You know that He is holy. You know that He is righteous. That He, he must punish sin. In fact, uh, listen to the words of, of the Apostle Paul in, in, 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, in Romans chapter 1. Verse 32, he says, And although they, that being those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Oh, dear friends, you know the God of Scripture, and you know that your sin earns you eternal damnation. But, not, but you do not deal with it before God, but instead you give hearty approval to those who practice your sin. The same sins that you're enslaved to. You just give hearty approval to them. Friends, you're just, you're just piling your guilt layer upon layer. My friends, don't lose your soul for your sins. Instead, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved from your sin. 
So let's look at the second thing. So we've established that the law shows us the character of God. Secondly, the character of man. And I've already covered a lot of this, so we won't spend too much time on this. But because we have, as I said a moment ago, broken the law, we have, we have uh, acted in contradiction to the character of God. And so it shows that there is no inherent goodness within man. It shows that there is no inherent righteousness. Listen to the words of Romans 3. Paul says in verse 10, As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Notice what he says there. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Many of you are swift to slaughter the innocent, friends. Even your own child. Think about it. The evil of, of killing an innocent person, but then to confound your guilt, to add guilt upon guilt, you not only do that, but you slaughter the, the child God has given you as a gift. See, the Bible says every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. God is so gracious, friends, and so kind toward you to give you a child. Many people wish for children, but they never get a child. Many people desire to have children, but they can't. Oh, friends... What a what an what a in uh, what an ungrateful an ungrateful spirit that is, what an unrighteous spirit that is to take God's gift and just throw it in the garbage. And so, what is the punishment of sin? What is the punishment of of those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have broken the law, those who have who have desecrated God's image? Well, Jesus spoke about it more than he even did heaven. And that is hell. That's hellfire, friends. You may ask, well, why did Jesus, if He was a Savior, why did He speak more about hell than He did heaven? Because He was a Savior. That's exactly why. He came to warn people of the eternal torment which those in hell undergo. Friends, Jesus spoke more about it than heaven because He does not desire for His people to perish. And friends, I must warn you about the terrors of hell. I must warn you about those who are on their way to hell, and you're probably one of them, friends. You're on your way to destruction. Do not die in your sins, for God will recompense you. He will bring judgment upon you. That is what hell is. It is God bringing judgment upon the wicked. It is God bringing judgment upon baby murderers. And so there's no hope. There's no hope. You're hopeless, friends. You are, you are without hope. You are headed there, and there's no amount of good you can do. You can't cover up the bad with your good. Just try that in a court of law. Just imagine a murderer here in Greenville County trying that. He said, well, Judge, don't worry. I, I know I murdered somebody, but listen. Since then, I haven't done, killed anybody else. I've given to charity, helped an old woman cross the street. I'm okay. That's not how it works, friends. God will not be bribed. He is holy. Don't forget that. Don't forget the holiness of God, friends. And that's why I, 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 I'm covering that so thoroughly because many of you are so quick to, to, to understand God's love and grace. But truly, that's not even really what biblical love is anyways. But you're quick to forget God's righteousness. But nonetheless, I want to tell you this. And this is where the text that we are looking at comes into play. And that is... In 1 Corinthians 1.18. See, friends, the Apostle Paul says, For the word of the cross. The cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is the, is the display of God's love toward sinners. God's absolute, eternal love toward His elect people. But also it is a display of God's righteous indignation against sin. And His clearing of His name. It's a vindication of His name. That He does not sweep it under the rug. I ask people a lot of times, I say, how are you going to go to heaven? They say, God forgives my sin. And they cannot explain to me how a holy God can forgive their sin. Well, the word of the cross is the answer to that. The cross of Jesus Christ is an answer, the answer to that very question. How can a holy God, how can a God who hates sin and who hates the sinner himself forgive the sinner and allow them to go into heaven and allow them to enter into his family? 
and to be adopted as a child of God, it is by the word of the cross. It is by the word of the cross. See, Galatians 4, 4 tells us that when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a virgin, born under the law. He came and fulfilled the law. Matthew 5, 17. He said, I did not come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them. Matthew 3. He says, I came to fulfill all righteousness. He came to live a perfect life, and then he was, he was stretched upon the cross of Calvary. He was pinned there to the cross, and he suffered those hours on that cross under the, the just wrath of Almighty God against sin. The Father unleashed his fury against sin upon his Son. The, the, the horrors of hell were experienced by Christ on the cross. Uh, the Bible says in, in Isaiah 53, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Uh, Isaiah 53.10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him. Isaiah 55.5, But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Friends, Christ on the cross experienced something that we cannot see. People will often talk about the physical sufferings of Christ, but friends, you must understand the, the agony of his soul that he underwent. The, the infinite price for sin, the infinite fury of God was unleashed upon His Son. The cup of God's wrath was, was poured out on Christ. He drank every last drop of it. In fact, uh, when He died, that cup was turned over and there was not a single drop left. And God did that because He so, as the Bible tells us, He so loved the world. He so loved His people whom He foreknew. He so loved His church. Uh, the Bible says in, uh, in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having washed her with the water of the Word, that He might present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Christ died to make men holy. Christ died to make men free. Christ died to save people from the bondage to sin and the condemnation of sin. Friends, Christ died so that sinners like yourself could be freed from being enslaved to the sin of murdering your child. You're enslaved to this. You're enslaved to be out here, friends. You're out here because you're a slave to sin. Jesus said in, in John 8, everyone who sins is the slave of sin. But then he said, but if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Friends, Christ came to set the captives free. And so he died, and then on the third day, he gloriously rose from the grave. He rose as the public display, as the, as the public display that God had accepted his sacrifice, and that it was a soothing aroma. It was, it was pleasing to God. Listen to the words of Romans 4.25. It says, He was delivered over because of our, our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. He was raised that sinners might be forgiven. And then 40 days later, he was exalted in glory. And he is seated there now in heaven. And he sits at the right hand of, of majesty on high. And he is exalted. He is being praised by angels. He is the Lord of glory. He is reigning over everything. He, is, he has ordained the days of your life. He has called you into being. And he sustains you. He gives you every breath you breathe. Every heartbeat that you have. And he is the sovereign Lord. And the Bible tells us in Philippians 2, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. My friends, I want to tell you something. If you don't bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ today and you harden your heart for the rest of your life and you reject the gospel, there will be a day when God will make you bow and you will have no other option but to confess. And at that point it will be too late and you will be cursed forever. Friends, and dear, dear friends, oh, how I love you and care for you. Listen, listen to me. This is important. Listen, you're, the one who is your friend is the one who tells you the most truth. Friends, your friends, perhaps you have a lot of friends who affirm you and affirm your lifestyle. They're not your friends. They're not looking for your best interests. I'm willing to look like a fool to tell you the truth. That if you continue in your sin, you'll perish. And if you go through with this, you'll have this guilt upon your soul. And God is not going to wipe it away arbitrarily. And God will not. He will not compromise His holiness. In fact, uh, listen, this is uh, Jesus in Matthew uh, 25. He is teaching on the judgment day. There's a coming a day when God's judgment is going to fall. And listen to what Jesus says is going to happen. Verse 41. 
then he will say to those on his left, and this is Jesus talking about what he is going to say one day to the wicked. He says, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. But I praise God that God is so gracious. He, he opens heaven's gates wide to those who will come to Him through Jesus Christ. The, the gates of glory are open to you, friends. Come and grab hold of Christ. Fling uh, yourself upon the Savior and don't let go. Grab hold of the ark of salvation. Friends, the, the flood of God's wrath is going to come and will consume the wicked. But God has built an ark. He's prepared the ark of salvation. And the, the door is open. Simply walk in. Go and flee to Christ, friends. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is the outward call of the gospel. This is the word of the cross. A turn from your sin. Flee your rebellion. Flee your idolatry. A flee your selfishness. Flee your murdering, your pornography, your fornication, your drunkenness, your anger, your wrath, and your malice. Flee your sins and cry, and, and cry out to God that He might save you for Jesus' sake. Friends, as the text reads, it is foolishness to those who are perishing. It is foolishness, but listen to what it says. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Friends, if the word of the cross is making sense to you at this moment, then God perhaps is doing a work on your heart. In fact, if it is making sense to you, and you see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ revealed in the gospel, then it is surely the Lord God working on your heart. For no one can come to Christ unless the Father draws him. So if you are, if you're being drawn to Christ right now, cry out to God. Cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Repent and believe the gospel. Mark 1.15, Jesus said in Luke 13.3, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke 13.5, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In Acts 20, the same thing is spoken. That you must have faith in the finished work of Christ. You must put your confidence in the work of Jesus Christ. Flee your religious trust. Flee your trust in a priest or a pastor or your Bible reading or your prayers or your penance. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your confidence in His finished work. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I, cr I the cross of Christ I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless come to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Friends, let that be the cry of your heart this morning. Cry out to Christ. Get out of this place. We're willing to help you. Choose life. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do that, the Bible says you will be forgiven of all your sin. God can justly forgive you of your sin because it was punished on Christ. It was punished at the cross. God unleashed His wrath on Christ and therefore He will never unleash it upon you. If you trust in Him, if your confidence is in Christ, the Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they are safe. The Bible says in Acts 4.12, there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name but the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other name but the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by which you can be saved. And His very name, Yeshua, means Yahweh saves. Friends, trust on Christ. Flee to Christ. And not only will God forgive you of your sin, but He will wrap you in the righteousness of Christ. He will clothe you in the, in the perfect garments of Christ's righteousness. You will, be, you will be justified on the merits of Jesus Christ. You'll be justified on the merits of Christ, accredited with having lived His life because He was credited with having lived yours. Friends, this is the word of the cross, which is the power of God to those who are being saved. It is precious. It is glorious. It is a pearl of great price. It is the summit of all doctrine. It is the crown jewel. It is the treasure which trumps all other treasures. It is the most precious truth. Sir, you need to be born again. You need to be saved from your sin. And listen to what the Apostle Paul says in, in, in verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. God, God the Father declares that He will cast aside the wisdom of men. In other words, this is not something, the word of the cross is not something that is the invention of men. It is not something that men have thought of. It is not something that men have come up with. It is not something that I invented or anyone else. It is of the Lord God Almighty. It is by specific, divine, special revelation. It is built on the infallible, inerrant, inspired word of the living God. My friends, this is the word of the cross. 
Flee to Christ. Flee to Christ today. See the kindness of God, my friends. Behold the grace of God as it is revealed in Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It says, or do, you not, or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? God's kindness, my friends, leads you to repentance. Look at the grace of God as it is revealed in Jesus Christ. Look at it, my friends. Look long and hard and see the mercy of God. See the kindness of God. The Apostle John says in 1 John 3, 1, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Oh, and I want to address in these closing moments you who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. You who claim to be believers in Jesus. Oh, you hypocrites. Repent of your folly. Repent of your hypocrisy. Jesus says, many will say to me on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord. He says, I will say to those people, depart from me. You who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. Friends, if you say you're a Christian and you're here at this place and you're living in sin and you're not practicing righteousness, it's not that you're justified by work. You, the evidence of conversion is that you work. Not, we don't work to be saved, we work because we are saved. Friends, that is the, that's the mark of a genuine convert. If you're a hypocrite today, believe, flee your hypocrisy. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. All of grace, 100% of God, a free gift of mercy, a free gift of grace. Now grab hold of it, friends. Grab hold of the word of, cro of, the, cro the, word of the cross. Be like Abraham who believed the promises of God. Who believed the promise of God concerning the fact that he was going to have an heir uh, come forth from his own body. He was going to have his own son in his old age. And he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He believed that there was going to be a seed that would come forth from him. The Savior, Mashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the centerpiece of, 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 the, of the scriptures, of all history. He is everything, my friends. Believe upon Him. Come to Him and be saved. And give God glory for it. It is all to the end that God would be glorified. God has so designed it and so ordered it to bring glory to His name. To bring honor to His name. To bring adoration to Himself and His Son. to the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Blessed be the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. For from Him and to Him and through Him all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Dear friends, give God the glory. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and give Him the glory for the great things He has done. So my friends, in closing, we've seen here in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, that the, and in verse 19, that the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And it is not of the invention or wisdom of men, but it is of God. It springs forth from God's brilliance and wisdom so that He is glorified, so that He is honored, and so that He is praised. So dear friends, give God the glory. He is worthy of glory. He is worthy of honor. Flee your sins, my friends, for soon it will be too late. I want to end off with these words from the Apostle Peter. In uh, 1 Peter 5, he simply says in verse 11, very, very, very succinctly, he says, To Him, that is Christ, be dominion forever and ever. Amen.